All right. Um, actually, it's interesting that Gerard came in and talked about benchmarking because that's actually an important aspect from a system administration point of view on the, these systems. Um, not only for benchmarking and testing your cluster, but for regression testing. When you make changes to your system, uh, you know, you want to be able to go back and ensure you're not losing performance. You know, we've done some BIOS updates at some time where all of a sudden lost two or three percent performance across the board, and it's like. You know, so is that really supposed to be there? You know, so, so it is important. Um, the other aspect I was going to say about the benchmarking thing is uh, make sure you build and tune benchmarks that your customer base is going to run. Um, I know you've got a little bit more limited customer base. From our point of view, uh, we have to support hundreds of different application areas and domain spaces, everything from their own custom graduate student written code all the way to community codes that the users don't actually have any idea about and they just want to run a pre-compiled and optimized version of. Um, from our point of view, it's important that we try to capture as many of those different benchmark applications as we can. Uh, we're actually going through this right now. Um, uh, Frontera was part of the first project that we're doing for part of the uh, NSF-funded leadership class computing facility. Um, and right now we're trying to plan for what we're going to deploy in 2025 timeframe. Uh, looking at all the processors and everything like that. So uh, one aspect that Gerard didn't mention about the benchmarking and something that we'd highly recommend you do is to characterize what is report, important for your benchmarks. You know, do roof line models. Figure out, are you really flop based? Gigahertz, you know, is your, are your frequency of the processor important? Is memory bandwidth important? Figure out what the characteristics are because you need to be able to project to the next system and figure out how much performance you're going to get on that next hardware. And it's only gotten more challenging as the technologies have changed. Um, and and uh, um, as we're finding, uh, unfortunately, certain technologies tend to do better with certain applications, and other technologies do better with other uh, applications. And so, but building one general purpose computer is becoming harder. Um, you're, you're tending to have to build more heterogeneous type systems where you have different types of hardware inside your environment just to support that. But I'll get to that a little bit later in my talk. So. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Todd Reiner. I'm Director of Advanced Computing Systems, and the slides are not advancing now. <laughs> um, I'm Director of Advanced Computing Systems at, at TAC. I've been there for almost 20 years now. Uh, um, and uh, see if you can see it there. Oh, there it goes. It's working now. There it goes, okay. Um, I've been there for almost 20 years now. I've seen the whole history of going through <laughs> uh, computers always. In fact, I was just mentioning it to Keith. The, the very first system we deployed was, I think, about two teraflops of performance. Uh, and now one of your single sockets is, is more than two teraflops of performance. Um, we were even joking, uh, uh, Ranger, our very first large scale system we deployed in 2007, 2008 timeframe uh, was a uh, little over 400 gigaflops. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, 400 teraflops. Uh, so nowadays, you can buy a GPU node that is almost 200 teraflops. <laughs> so you only need two of those nodes, or at least a future one, uh, the, two or three of those nodes to be able to uh, outperform what we're doing nowadays. So um, anyway, uh, I want to talk, uh, no, no, not working. <laughs> it was just working. I'll just advance. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our current production systems. Uh, some of you who were here last year, basically we haven't added really any new systems this last year. Um, uh, the big one that we've been focusing on is Lone Star 6. It was deployed in 2021. It's about a, had a year of, of production now. Uh, we've gone through a round of updates on it and everything. I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges we had on that one. Uh, still operating Stampede 2. It's in its sixth year of operation. That's pretty long life for an HPC system. Uh, we are struggling a little bit with some of the hardware failures uh, starting to happen now. Uh, the main thing is disk drives. Um, our storage arrays were failing disks at a very high rate, a much higher rate than we had expected uh, over the life. So, uh, uh, and in fact, the, two years ago, I think we had a triple drive failure in one of our arrays, which is always fun to have to try to recover from. But there are mechanisms to be able to do it. But um, it's getting long in the tooth. We have written a proposal to replace it. Uh, we hope to be able to replace it later this year, uh, should funding become available. Um, but unfortunately, they're not doing the $30 million systems anymore. It's only going to be about $10 million in funding. So, um, Frontera is really our big flagship system. Uh, it's been in production. Now we're in our third year of production on it. Um, actually, about to go into our fourth year of production uh, this summer. So, 
Uh, it's, uh, it's been a workhorse. Um, it's it's uh, over 8,000 nodes, and it's something that I'm going to talk a lot about, uh, mainly because even though it's been in workhorse, it's also where we do a lot of our evaluations. Um, we want to try to do these apples-to-apples -apples comparisons of figuring out what technologies are going to work in the future. So, you know, we've added a lot of hardware, uh, including file systems, interconnect, different, different types of technologies to uh, Frontera to see if we can push the boundaries at 8,000 clients and see if, see if stuff really still operates at that scale. So, all right, let me jump into Frontera. So just a quick, quick highlights on the hardware summary again. So we've got uh, basically 8,340 total nodes uh, when you put everything together. Um, uh, we've got mostly uh, the Cascade Lake processors. These are the 80, 8180s, 80, yeah, 8280s. Uh, that we have uh, in there now, the, the 28 core, uh, 56 cores per node. Uh, um, but really nice processor for the general purpose that we do here. Uh, in terms of the applications we run, it was a great uh, performance. Uh, the memory bandwidth per core stayed fairly consistent, and it's one thing Intel has done with their processors, is they've stayed fairly consistent on the memory bandwidth per core. Uh, so it's been interesting as we've seen more and more cores going into the sockets that that stayed uh, relatively consistent. Um, uh, the challenge is, is, of course, you've got the AMD processors, which have a lot more cores, and that's what we ended up going with in, in uh, uh, Lone Star 6. So, a um, couple of other little highlights. It is HDR and Finiband. Uh, it, it's over, uh, uh, we got director class switches, so we have six of these uh, big, large networks uh, switches that connect everything together. And then we've got uh, DDN as our storage on this system. We have a mix of both spinning and flash storage. Um, the challenge we've had with the flash storage is we were using their IME burst buffer technology. Um, and if you haven't experimented with that, well, unfortunately, uh, it tends to work well for some applications, but doesn't actually work well with, with a lot of the applications that we use. Um, so unfortunately, it hasn't really solved the problem we had for flash performance. Uh, so we are evaluating a couple of different options right now. Um, in fact, I'm about to deploy Weka on some of this hardware because it's, it actually is agnostic to the hardware and they've had more software support. Uh, and we did an evaluation at small scale and I'm about to take uh, 32 of those 72 servers and deploy a Weka on it and see if we can push it. It's a, a one year proof of concept uh, that, that we plan to do. And I have some more details on that uh, a little bit later too. Um, so the compute nodes, and this is something that uh, uh, was new to us when we first deployed it, but these are direct liquid cooled systems. Uh, so be prepared for this. Everything moving forward, we're starting to see more and more direct liquid cooling, immersion, some other technology. Air is just not going to be sufficient for the power that's going into these sockets. Uh, you know, we're already see testing some, some brand new Sapphire Rapids nodes. It's a kilowatt a node. <laughs> and that's just two sockets with memory in it. Um, so uh, uh, being able to cool that is getting challenging with air. Uh, you know, we're already pushing 60 kilowatts a rack in our current Frontera system. Uh, in our immersion system, we're about 70 kilowatts a rack. Uh, our next uh, follow-on to Frontera that we're going to deploy in 2025, we expect is going to be a little over 100 kilowatts a rack is, is what we're, we're planning for right now. So. Uh, as system administrators, be prepared for your facilities to start distributing water to your racks or some kind of secondary loops uh, because it's probably going to be com coming if you're deploying at scale. Um, so uh, if you notice in the picture here, you can see we have basically cool IT uh, loops on the system. Uh, that's what provides the, the bulk of the cooling. Uh, however, since it's only the processors that are cooled, there's still some other power inside the chassis that you have to do some cooling for. So what we did on it is we put uh, chilled doors on the back. So about 75% of the cooling comes from the direct liquid cooled, 25% of the cooling comes from the chilled doors. So, so about 15 kilowatts uh, out, out of the chilled doors. Um, and that makes it room neutral. Um, it was a good solution for us because it fit into the facility we had and we didn't have a lot of air cooling in there anyway. Uh, so we did need to make sure that we had as much uh, cooling direct to the system as we could. So um, we really like these nodes. These are four nodes in 2U, uh, the way the chassis are designed. Uh, and they've been really great workhorses. In fact, we have a, a large number of them on, on Stampede 2 as well. Um, and then we have the AMD follow-on chassis as part of the, the Lone Star 6 uh, system. So. Uh, in terms of the, the racks themselves, and this is also something important when you start thinking about the, the cooling and, and, and everything as well, um, we've had to go to, gone to very deep racks. 
Um, so not only did we have you know, the power in the back of the rack for distribution, you have your networking uh, area in the back of the rack, now you have to have your chilled, chilled water distribution or some kind of uh, liquid cooling distribution in the back of the rack. Every single node has its own connection to the manifold, uh, liquid connection. So what we've had to do is basically add a caboose to the back of the rack. They're about five and a half feet deep now <laughs> uh, when you look at the racks for Frontera. Um, and, uh, uh, a lot of that is just so that we can accommodate the additional room to be able to provide the manifolds to, to do the liquid cooling in the racks. Uh, so again, something else to keep in mind when you start designing and planning out these systems in the future. Um, for us, it's also important that we be able to work on the hardware. Um, all of the nodes in this case are rear accessible. Um, so we have to be able to pull the nodes out inside all the liquid cooling manifolds, all the power distribution, and all the InfiniBand and, and Gig E cabling that's in the rack. Um, and so we did work with Dell in terms of designing and laying out the rack so that we could still pull out all the hardware in the rack and work on it. Uh, we do our own hardware repairs at TAC. We, we have a couple of guys on site that basically maintain and keep the systems uh, working. Um, and we've had to do a lot of work that I'm going to talk about here uh, in a few minutes uh, on the nodes. And so it's important for us to be able to work on the nodes and not have to disconnect or power down other nodes you know, or manage other things in, in the system. Uh, uh, to, to be able to uh, work on the hardware. So, um, and, and by the way, that's true of every system. Uh, I have deployed Craze, Sun, SGIs in the past and everything. DIMs fail. <laughs> you, you're gonna have to replace a DIM and a node every once in a while. Um, I, don't, I don't care what the vendors say, they fail. <laughs> and they will fail over time, so. Now this is the layout of Frontera. So uh, it's, it's actually crammed in a very small space and we were able to do that because of the liquid cooling. Uh, the other thing about these racks is they're a little bit wider. They're the 30 inch wide racks, not the 24 inch wide racks. So you notice they don't quite align on the tiles uh, quite, quite uh, exactly. So um, at the ends of the row and at the middle are where our cooling distribution units are located. Um, each one of these is a 750 uh, kilowatt uh, cooling unit. Uh, so, and they're redundant, so we have enough power to be able to, or enough cooling for one row so that we can run on one, or on, on two of them, we can lose one and still operate. Uh, the CDUs also have redundant pumps in them. Uh, we've actually been very happy with the CDUs and the overall uh, chilled doors and everything. They've worked really well. Uh, the vendor's been very, very uh, cooperative with us. Uh, cool IT is the people who sell it, but Cool Terra is actually the manufacturer. They're located over in the UK. Uh, and, and we really do like their CDUs, and, and they've worked with us when we stumbled into some gotchas here or there. It's like a little bit of hot spots in a few areas, and we did some tweaking on the pump, pumping and the CDUs, and we were able to get uh, better, more distributed cooling across the whole system. So um, I point out the storage is actually located at the top row, row there. We actually have some UPS uh, in the data center that feeds just the storage and the switches. Uh, we do not keep the compute hardware on UPS. Uh, it's, it's way too much power. Uh, Frontera itself, uh, when we're running full bore, our LIN pack was about five and a half megawatts of total power. So, uh, uh, so that's, that was that's quite a lot of power uh, for running the system. So, um, I mentioned the uh, racks are liquid cooled. Also, interestingly enough, the, the core switches are liquid cooled as well. Um, so, uh, so when I say liquid cooling is coming, you're going to be getting it even if you're deploying the director class switches. So, all right. Now I'm going to spend some time on some of the latest updates and, and challenges we've had uh, on the system since uh, uh, we, we've gone into this uh, last year. So uh, again, we are trying to keep up on the BIOS updates and IDRAC updates. Uh, we did update to the latest 216.1 BIOS uh, and IDRAC 610. Um, we tend to wait on some of the versions, like we didn't deploy the 6.0 version of the IDRAC. We like to wait till the dot ones are coming out, you know, let them shake out all the fu funny little things. Um, I do joke with the vendors, if, if there's a bug or some problem with the software, one of our users is gonna find it, because <laughs> inevitably they're good at that. Um, and uh, uh, so from our point of view, it's important that we, we wanna make sure that we have a stable enough version, uh, but we do wanna try to keep up. Um, same thing on operating systems. We typically don't go to the dot zero versions of, of operating systems. We usually wait till the dot one is out just to try, try to wait as long as we can. Um, we're still running Mellanox OFED 5.4 on this system. We are planning to update, to, I think 5.7 is out now, maybe even later than that, maybe uh, 5.8. Um, um, but we did update the firmware and switches on the HCAs this last year. 
and it resolved one of the long outstanding issues we had. Adaptive routing now works <laughs> at scale. Um, we had a long uh, issue we'd been struggling with for actually a couple of years, ever since we deployed uh, Frontera, where uh, things would work initially, um, but after a while the adaptive routing would start to cause deadlocks or some kind of routing issues inside the fabric. Uh, it turns out it was a firmware issue with our core switches. Uh, once we updated the firmware, we do have adaptive routing on. Um, the downside with adaptive routing is it doesn't always help all your applications. <laughs> um, so your mileage may vary. So you may need to experiment a little bit with it. Uh, if your applications are doing a lot of all-to-all, -all, uh, FFTs, uh, if you're doing fast forward transforms or anything like that, and you're doing a lot of all-to-all -all communications, absolutely it does help. Uh, if you are seeing a lot of congestion on your fabric due to your users, uh, I think adaptive routing would help there too. Um, where we're seeing some challenges on it is uh, small messages and, and, and uh, uh, it unfortunately increases latency st substantially. Um, and this is where we're having some challenges at scale. Uh, one of the ones that really str we struggle with is MPI barrier is twice the time that it should be. Um, and barriers are used an awful lot for synchronization of, of tasks and everything with MPI, and, and uh, unfortunately that does inhibit performance on some applications. So you may have to test uh, with the adaptive routing. What we've done on our system is basically we set uh, a one service lane with adaptive routing on. This is the nice thing about InfiniBand. You can kind of control some things on the service lanes. So we turned it on on one service lane, and what we tell our users is, okay, when you go and you want to benchmark on it, run in the same job script, set the environment variable to run on, on the service lane without adaptive routing, and then right below it in the next entry of the job script, so you're using the same nodes, you've got apples to apples, turn on adaptive routing and rerun the same exact benchmark again and see what you get. Um, and again, some, some codes have seen some improvement, some codes unfortunately have slowed down. So, um, and this is where, uh, as a system administrator, it's getting more challenging from our point of view, because now, I can't just go tell the user, use this optimization, use this, use this setting, use this. It's like, you gotta kinda go test and go figure it out uh, in some ways yourself. So, um, This also goes back to the compilers. So we have deployed one API on the system. Unfortunately, what we found with the compilers is some things run slower with the new Fortran or, or C compilers. And so, uh, uh, but we've been working with the, the Intel team quite closely, trying to make sure that all the improvements that are getting into the old, that uh, were in the old versions, are actually getting implemented into the new versions of the compilers. We certainly don't want to lose performance just by upgrading compiler versions. Um, and so we, we uh, this is something that still is a work in progress that we're still working through. Um, but, but the nice thing is they still have the legacy compilers built with the one API, so you still can go back and use the legacy compilers uh, should you need to. Um, the other big thing we did, and this is kind of we've been struggling with because we've been working with DDN on this, is, is trying to keep up to date on the DDN uh, uh, software. Um, so we run the Exascaler appliance versions of the DDN uh, uh, hardware. Uh, so that means Luster runs on the controller itself. Uh, so there's two different components that get updated. There's the, the controller OS, and then there's the Exascaler Luster version, server version OS, uh, part of the OS. Um, what we're doing now is we up actually upgraded to the, the controller versions, but we didn't upgrade the Exascaler. They asked us to hold off because they found some bugs with it and then didn't want us to deploy. So. Uh, but we are working and hopefully going to deploy the latest Luster server versions um, uh, uh, hope later this year. Um, so uh, the other big thing, and I mentioned this last year at the talk, is we've been taking time out of the system to do these full-scale runs. And, and some of this is really just to push the boundaries of what users can do on the system. Uh, for those of you who have run or operated systems, you know, trying to get full system access while you're in normal production just isn't really feasible. <laughs> uh, you want somebody who runs run a benchmark, well, you're going to drain and, and you're going to waste a lot of resources trying to drain and, and, and uh, uh, get, get the big job scheduled on the full system. So uh, what we've done for those uh, cases is we've like, okay, for 24 hours you get dedicated access to all 8,000 nodes on the system. And, and you get to run, you know, on 8192, you get your 8K power of two uh, setting, and, and you can run whatever benchmarks you want for 24 hours, or your application runs. In fact, we've got some guys who do their production runs in these Texas scale, where all they want to do is generate data for 24 hours, and then they'll spend the next three months basically processing and analyzing the data that they've generated. So, um, but this has been real good for us just to push the software and make sure things work. It also allows us to test things at scale. You know, do the MPI scale, does, does, do the client, software client scale for like 
uh, Lustre or, or uh, file systems. Uh, we have tested uh, a vast Weka at scale on Frontera, and uh, um, and we did it during one of the Texas scale days. Uh, um, and it it lets us kind of shake out the system and also lets the users figure out, okay, what kind of problems can I solve? It also helps us plan for the next system because inevitably for, for the NSF funding, you obviously have to show and justify why you need to get that funding. And part of that is the science cases behind it. And we're allowing people to solve science problems at this scale that they couldn't normally solve uh, in, in regular production. So we've already passed more than 5 million jobs on the system. It's been a pretty big workhorse. Uh, you know, the, the, what is interesting is if you look at the number of hours consumed on the system, the vast majority of the hours consumed on the system are on jobs that are part of what we consider large jobs. And that's more than 512 nodes used in, in a single job. Um, that's, that's actually a staggeringly large number of jobs and amount of cycles. We regularly, in fact, one group regularly runs 2,000 nodes, 2048 nodes. Every day there's a job in the queue, and they just keep one ready, you know, one right after the other, and they run on 2,000 nodes every day, and they consume all of their hours every allocation cycle. So, um, and as I mentioned, really the big thing from us was, was uh, the, uh, the evaluation hardware um, and uh, uh, testing that we're going to do, and I'm going to get to that uh, uh, here in a second. So uh, we had our usual operational challenges. Uh, really the one thing we're struggling with this past year uh, is, you know, we've, we've got the users kind of under control. We've had fewer file system interrupts this past year due to users doing bad things. But unfortunately, almost always, uh, when something happens on the file system or something crazy is going on uh, on the system, it's, it's usually some user doing something bad. Uh, and it usually takes us a while. Um, the one I want to spend a few minutes on is the system leaks, um, the cooling system leaks. So, you know, the system was supposed to be designed with zero leaks. Well, unfortunately, as things happen, it turns out that we had some bad seals manufactured on some of our cooling blocks, uh, and we've had a fair number of them. In fact, I think we're up to about 500 out of the original 8,000 that we've had to replace so far, and that's just starting to get through the replacements. We're probably going to have to replace uh, a couple of thousand more by the time it's all said and done. Um, this has been a huge challenge because, unfortunately, from our point of view, we don't see the leak until after it's already happened. And that usually means the node has failed with some kind of voltage error or something else. Now, we have been a little bit lucky in that we've been able to be, catch some of these leaks before they damaged uh, hardware components. But because the secondary cooling fluid is this ethylene glycol uh, solution, it's like antifreeze. Um, when it gets on the motherboards or inside the sockets uh, of, the, of the servers, they are destroyed. Um, so uh, every time we have a leak, we're basically losing a motherboard potentially some DIMMs and at least one or two CPUs, uh, depending on, on what's happened with that. So, um, uh, but uh, the good news is, is it was clearly, they've, they've done some FA, they've done some analysis, and it turns out that it was like one of those five, five cent gaskets that was poorly manufactured, it hurts a certain, hurts, hits a certain temperature that the processors will run at, and melts. <laughs> and once the gasket melts, then you get leakage. So um, the good news is all the new ones we get are fixed. They don't, we haven't seen recurrence of the issue. Um, but it also means that we've, informed, we've told Dell and we've told other vendors as well that, look, you've got to put leak detection inside your servers. We've got to get notification that there's a leak before it gets outside of the server or spreads to other servers around it uh, inside the rack. And, and that's something they have implemented on the newer hardware. Uh, all the leak detection now is built into the system. So. Uh, unfortunately, being early adopters, this is kind of one of the challenges we struggle with. And one of the, one of the areas we bleed on, uh, and hopefully y'all don't have to suffer from the same issues. So, um, uh, The other thing uh, I, I was talking about earlier, um, th this is also important for regression testing and, and everything. Uh, we did a uh, luster upgrade uh, last year uh, that actually broke uh, a couple of our applications. Um, and uh, it was one of those things where it's like, oh, man, it's like weird, you can't reproduce it. It's, you gotta run for like two hours on 20 nodes and one of the nodes will die, but I can't tell you which one is gonna die. Um, and uh, uh, the good news on this one is I was able to iterate and I was able to get a re finally get a code where I could reproduce it within a couple of hours. Uh, so what we then started doing is going back through Lustre client versions. So we started going back, okay, we started with the one we knew was working and then we started incrementing up and then we finally found the one where things broke. Uh, it took us about three weeks of testing, though, uh, to finally find the version that broke. And once we pointed them to that version, 
uh, they were able to finally debug the issue and get us one that fixed it. The good news is, is I knew when it was working because I could run this application, it wouldn't fail again. Uh, the downside is, is I couldn't 100% reproduce it exactly. I just knew it was going to fail. I just couldn't tell them which one was going to fail. So. And as I mentioned, we did finally uh, resolve that long outstanding bug with the adaptive routing. Uh, and of course, very application dependent. So you're gonna have to test this yourself. So, um, But the big thing that I wanna talk about now is future technologies. And, and this is where I tend to be focusing a lot of my effort um, right now is because we're trying to plan for the next big system. So um, for those of you who aren't aware of what the NSF uh, Leadership Class Computing Facility Project is, uh, it's a large facilities project as part of the NSF office. Uh, the plan is to build a system that will deliver 10x the performance of Frontera. Um, and we're supposed to deliver it in with, um, within five or six years of when Frontera went into operation. Um, and so uh, 10x in that time frame is quite challenging without throwing a lot of nodes and a lot of money at the problem. Um, so, uh, so one of the things we're working on right now is, A, trying to figure out which processor vendor, which, which accelerator technology is going to work for us. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time going through and collecting applications that run on our system. Uh, and again, this is, kind of gets back to the benchmarking discussion that was earlier. Um, uh, you know, we're trying to find a, you know, characteristic suite of applications that we can use as a, as a science case to say these are the science problems that the new system is going to solve, and B, as acceptance tests. Because <laughs> we, we have to figure out is the system performing as the vendors claimed it would uh, uh, at, at, you know, at that time frame. And so, uh, so going back, uh, our HPC folks, not the systems team, but the HPC folks has gone back and done a lot of analysis on the applications that run our system. We've selected some from the various uh, domains. In fact, we've got 20 that we're starting with in the various domains. Uh, and the goal is, is to try to run these on as many different architectures and, and uh, uh, environments that we can uh, to figure out, A, do they work, will they perform, and what, what do we want to deploy uh, to support these applications in the future. Um, so I've got a list of kind of different, different accelerators we've been testing with. We've got an ARM from uh, NVIDIA. This is the Ampere. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, version before Grace comes out. Uh, uh, it, it, unfortunately, it's a little bit limited. It doesn't have the vector instructions. It doesn't have a, a lot of the 64-bit improvements, but it's an 80-core processor, and actually, it performs pretty well uh, if you're not vector, if your applications aren't ve were well vectorized. More importantly, it's got two A100s in it, and so this is one of the things we're using for our development box, just to confirm that applications will build and run in the ARM environment using the NVIDIA GPUs on those boxes. Um, got some brand new Intel Sapphire Rapids box, thanks to Keith. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, these have been fantastic. I don't know if you've got, got your hands on Sapphire Rapids yet, but uh, um, we are very impressed with the Sapphire Rapids HBM performance. Our applications that are memory bandwidth sensitive are getting 1.8, even 2x what a regular Sapphire Rapids with DDR5 gets with, that are memory bandwidth sensitive. Um, so. Uh, if you are memory bandwidth sensitive and you, you've got applications that are like that, I highly recommend you test the Sapphire Rapids. The main limitation on the Sapphire Rapids is 64 gig per socket. So you only get 128 gig per node if you've got a two socket node. Um, now, for our point of view, that fits a lot of the applications. So That's the HPM, That's the HPM part, yeah. I'm just, yeah, without DDR5, yeah, with, with no DDR5. Um, we have tested in cache mode, and it does work pretty well, but of course, as soon as you get outside of the cache, you start to degrade in performance, you get your DDR performance. Uh, we're still experimenting quite a bit, um, but uh, like I said, the HBM parts have been quite impressive, and you know, well over a terabyte a second of memory bandwidth stream measured. Um, so again, if you are memory bandwidth sensitive per, per application, uh, uh, very, very good box. Um, I don't have any Genoa processors as of yet. I've got some on, on order. Um, I'm, I, it's interesting, I, you know, AMD, uh, the new AMD processors, our concern is, is, is you know, they uh, put a lot more cores on there, but they didn't get a lot more memory bandwidth to keep up with all the cores uh, that are on the node. Uh, so it's unclear to us if that 96 core processor is gonna be good, or you know, maybe that 64 core at a higher frequency. You got, now you got a lot of knobs to, to be able to dial in on the AMD. 
Uh, I've got a couple of the NEC uh, vector accelerators. Uh, these are very interesting in that, you know, when you install them and you put the software, they're doing a pretty good job with the software environment. But it goes back to kind of one of the things that we did way back when with the Knight's Corner cards on, on Stampede 1. Um, it's like a computer inside your computer. <laughs> because it's running its own OS, it's running its own thing, and you do all the compiling and everything. But if you've got a highly vectorized codes, like you were running stuff that was really good on the old uh, uh, SGI Altix or uh, something that was using the, the really high, high uh, bit uh, vector uh, algorithms, these accelerators are fantastic. <laughs> um, the challenge is, is it's like having a computer inside your computer and you're having to manage multiple OSs, multiple things. And uh, something we haven't been able to do is test at scale with the NEC. We just don't have enough. Um, so it's unclear to us how well it's going to work uh, MPI-wise. But again, if you've got a vector, vector uh, a code, um, the accelerators do very well. Uh, test, test some Fujitsu ARM 64s. Uh, so these are the 64-bit ARM processors that have HBM on them. Um, unfortunately, they really didn't perform as much as we expected, or as, th as much as we uh, thought we could get out of them. Uh, we think that some of it is software. Um, you know, they don't have the right tune compilers. They haven't done a lot of the improvements that Intel necessarily has on the x86 processors. Yeah. Are you using the Fujitsu native platform or the Gray with like the beginning? So it is the Fujitsu native platform with the eight nodes and two U um, uh, little Fujitsu box that we. Yeah, well, so that's where we had problems. I could not get the Fujitsu compilers forever um, because the licensing was like a huge pain in the butt uh, to get everything to, to get over there. Uh, yeah, see, this is where our problem was. We, we tried the ARM compiler and, uh, of course, GCC. GCC didn't perform as well um, at the time. We need to go back, and I, I, I still don't have a Fujitsu license for their compilers yet, but how much improvement did you see when you... Did Quantum you're, Espresso, just the basic. 10x difference. Okay, we need to go back and revisit that Big then. Difference. Yeah. So. Yeah. See, this is this is the challenge as a system administrator. You know, we got this whole parameter space of trying to figure out where everything is going to fit in. And the FFTs are the kind of challenge on that. Okay. They just don't have the numerical. Um, they have a lot of memory bandwidth, but they don't, that is, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, another one we just got our hands on some next silicon. Again, these are kind of specialized accelerator cards. Uh, it, it's a little bit interesting in that they try to analyze the software and retune the software um, to run better on their accelerators. Um, still early, early testing on it, um, but you know, again, it probably has a good sweet spot in terms of application space it works well for. Uh, but. Uh, for general purpose, it may not be as, as applicable as, as some of these other accelerators. Um, one of the big challenges we're also seeing is GPU adoption. Okay, sure, AI machine learning, you know, uh, you know obviously hands down works great on the accelerators. Um, our challenge is, is we just don't have a lot of AI machine learning yet. Um, you know, most of the people are doing it are just single node toy problems, you know, and we're, we're, it's like we're we're high performance computing. We want you to really use lots of nodes. You know, get a lot of performance. They're like, no, no, no. My problem fits right here. I just need these two GPUs. And I'm done. And it's like, okay. Um, you know, we're trying to find AI machine learning. Uh, I understand. You know, as as companies and big big collections of customer data and stuff. That's where AI machine learning could really uh, uh, be useful. Uh, it's just not the data that we have yet. Um, and it makes building the next system a little more challenging because we're trying to weigh how much GPU. Uh, do we put in the next system? How much accelerator do we put? Um, one of the big compliments we've gotten about Frontera is that it was a primarily a CPU-based system. And a lot of our users, it just works. They compile, they run, they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about rewriting their application code. They don't have to worry about porting it. Uh, they already know how to tune. Um, so it's a very comfortable environment for them to work in. Uh, it's, it, our, some of the, one of the questions we have is, is it a chicken and egg problem? <laughs> do, we, do we have to force them? Do we just buy a GPU only system and force them? Like, look, you can't run unless you rewrite your application codes. Well, that leaves a lot of people behind. Yeah, David. Uh, is the uh, NSF forcing you to chase teraflops? No. So NSF has not been forcing us to chase teraflops, which I'm very happy about because I think, again, like Gerard said, teraflops doesn't measure anything. All LINPAC does is test that your, your system will maintain power and cooling appropriately <laughs> uh, for the biggest problem that will ever be solved on the, on the thing. 
so, so from our point of view, Linpack flops is, is meaningless. Uh, we're not chasing flops. Um, but from our point of view, there's also some applications that see a, a quite a bit of acceleration. Molecular dynamics codes, they consume a lot of cycles on our system, about 25, maybe even 30% of the cycles on all the systems. Um, you know, it's LAMPs, AMBER, NAMD, games, uh, those types of, they actually have decent GPU ports that can get three or four X what a CPU can do. You know, at that point in time, okay, well that's worth the extra cost of the GPUs. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, we don't wanna leave a whole bunch of our application space behind and uh, uh, supporting that other group of users. Uh, <laughs> so we're expecting that we'll have, still have a big CPU portion of the system. Uh, that is what we are designing for, but we are moving more and more instead of just having a small subsystem of GPUs, it's becoming a more substantial part of the system. In fact, it'll account for probably most of the flops on the system <laughs> in terms of the design, just, just for the sheer number of flops that they're providing. Uh, um, but again, you know, when we've done our 20 applications, I think only six or seven of the applications have any GPU in them and even then, sometimes it's only a small part of the application has been ported to the GPU. Um, and so uh, uh, um, the other thing we're challenging with on the benchmarking applications is, you know, sure, we get this one application. Let's say we get an AMD. We got a version of the AMD. And then they're like, oh, no, no, no. NVIDIA's got this other great version that they've rewritten over here, but it's completely different in terms of what it actually solves compared to this one. Well, how do you do your apples to apples comparison at that time? It's a different algorithm, different approach, and so, so it is getting a little more challenging. The other one I want to spend uh, some time on is file systems. So, um, you know, a lot of y'all probably struggle with file systems <laughs> at your own environments. Uh, it's the one weak spot and probably is the, the uh, I can say it is definitely the, the most frequent occurrence of downtime on our systems is when something happens to one of the file servers or a user <coughs> does something causes it to crash. Um, because of that, we're trying to uh, look at other things other than Lustre. You know, we have done Lustre in the past. We have deployed BGFS uh, on Lone Star 6, and it's worked pretty well. Um, you know, it, it has some little idiosyncrasies we stumbled across uh, with ACLs and some other, other little minor gotchas. Um, but uh, uh, the problem is, is those are designed for spinning disks. We got Flash coming, okay? What are we gonna do about Flash? Um, and with Flash, you can do some things like erasure coding and some other good, good things that necessarily spinning disks weren't designed to do. Um, I have been arguing, and my opinion on a lot of this has been like, at some point in time, I just don't think the spinning disks are gonna keep up. I think the, with the capacities of the Flash coming out, the commodity of Flash, everybody's got Flash. I mean, your, your phone. <laughs> the amount of flash memory being developed out there and the capacities that are coming, um, you know, this two terabyte uh, increment on the disk drive improvements just isn't gonna keep up capacity wise uh, for, for the future system. So, um, so we've been trying to figure out what we're gonna do about flash. Well, you know, I mentioned we have a bunch of IME hardware on, the, on our current Frontera system that we were using as burst buffer. We're gonna take half of that away and we're gonna deploy Weka. Um, we did Weka on eight nodes of that, and it worked pretty well. Uh, the one advantages to the Weka that we see is if you're dealing with lots of small files, it does a very good job uh, with lots of small files. Um, one thing we are struggling with is inconsistent performance. Um, you know, we'll run some applications, and sometimes we can see on the server side that they're doing, you know, pushing uh, 50, 60 gigabytes a second of, of bandwidth. And then other times they're only doing about 10. <laughs> and, and, and we don't have enough mechanism inside the file system to understand what's going on and why we're seeing this, this weird performance variability. Um, but, uh, but we hope if we deploy at scale, we can get some better measurements of it. We want to do a longer term uh, evaluation. We only did it for a couple of months that they gave us the license for. And we want to do it at a larger scale. The other big thing from us is we know this IME hardware hasn't worked well for our user base, and so we want to deploy something else on it. And Weka is the one thing that we'll, we can deploy now uh, on that, that, uh, that hardware. So, um, Vast is another one that we tested as well. Now, in this case, they gave us an evaluation hardware because they, they, they sell you the, the, the hardware as part of their uh, file system software. So, uh, so we connected it HDR into our InfiniBand fabric. Um, and the, Important thing about Vast is we did we were able to test it at over six thousand clients, 
so one of our Texas scale days, one group was running on 2,000 nodes. So we took about 6,000 of the nodes and mounted VAST, ran some performance tests. I, I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one of those things where you know you think it's advertised too good to be true, and then you start actually using it. It's like, wow, it actually just works. Uh, it, I mean, you know, I like to joke. Any vendor gives us hardware, we'll figure out some way to break it. Uh, we did break it, but it wasn't actually their problem. It was a hardware issue in that case, and that's that's okay. Well, <laughs> we understand. One of the nodes I did have a had a hardware problem, but. We were totally exercising it. I mean, we were running at full bore with writing, uh, reading 70 gigabytes a second, writing about 10 or 15 gigabytes a second intermittently. We took a server offline. File system just kept running, no issues. Degraded in performance, went down to about 40 gigabytes a second of read performance. Uh, but that's fine. It was still available. It still worked. Brought the server back online. Performance came back. Everything just resumed. This is like one of the things we've been desiring from a system administration point of view, a file system that doesn't go offline when the hardware fails. It doesn't have to do a failover, it doesn't have to do a recovery, it doesn't have to do all of this stuff. Uh, and VAST just did that. So uh, we, we haven't tested that yet with Weka, um, but uh, we do plan once we get our evaluation that we will test similar things with Weka. Uh, the other thing we tested with VAST is we did a live upgrade. We were running on the file system, beating it up, running you know, max performance, and we just upgraded all the servers. <laughs> and what was interesting was, is, is this is where we found our hardware problem because we started upgrading the servers. Uh, half of them got upgraded. Um, one of the nodes failed uh, during the, the hardware upgrade, uh, had a hardware problem, or during the uh, software upgrade. Uh, they said, oh, take that one offline. We ran at mixed versions for quite some time. So we had some servers upgraded, some of them not upgraded, still running uh, until they got the hardware fixed in that one node, and then everything just came back and was working. So. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Like I said, pleasantly surprised. That's not something that, that I was expecting out of, out of the, the file system. So uh, I think Weka advertises something similar, so we'll see if that, that does uh, something similar. Problem we have right now with Weka is it is limited to 4,000 clients. Uh, so we can't mount it on all 8,000 nodes on Frontera as of yet, but they are working to uh, get past that limitation. Uh, we do hopefully also uh, uh, will test uh, uh, other products that are coming out uh, soon that will, are going to be Flash. Uh, the downside, we, we need to make a decision on where we're going to deploy on the next system uh, within the next month or so. Uh, we have a, a, a fi final design review at the beginning of April, um, and so we, we kind of have to get, get, get some official decisions. We tried to make as ma a light, late binding decision as we can on this hardware technology just because the landscape has been changing and it's just been hard. Um, and from a system administration point of view, it's just getting harder because <laughs> now we have all this different hardware, technology, and software we're trying to deal with. Um, and, and one of my concerns with these file systems is, you know, with Lustre, I have the source code. I can go in, I can get a lot of the stuff. I can, you know, I can delve down and I can figure out what's going on. My concern with some of these is they're somewhat of a black box. Um, you know, if something's happened internally to the servers or something on their side, I won't have as much transparency into what's going on as I have on the Lustre. I know what server messages on the Lustre mean bad things, and, you know, I can kind of watch a lot of that stuff. I don't have those same, same uh, mechanisms in VAST and Weka. so, um, I, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was hooked over Amphetamine. Same with the Weka. The Weka, they both run IP over IB, though. Um, Okay, VAST may have some native InfiniBand, but you have to have the IP over IB to initiate the connections for the mount. Is it kind of like a native client situation? Yeah, so they do, they, they, uh, they overload NFS is my understanding. So you do have to install one of their client. It does compile against their, your kernel, um, and uh, uh, it, does, it mounts like an NFS when you do the mount command line. What's interesting is you give it a range of IPs, though, to use from so that it knows it has multiple servers to, to, to mount from. And, and that's how you control uh, uh, bandwidth access to the different clients, too. Um, so you can say, OK, these clients only get these servers. You know, These clients get these servers. And so you can actually have some QoS uh, in regard to that as well. So uh, it's pretty flexible. Um, the other big thing, and I, I, I didn't mention this, is, is the compression ratio, something that Flash is also going to provide to us. You know, we, we joked with it, they're like, oh yeah, we get great compression. It's like, no, yeah, we're not gonna get any compression on the data that our users generate. And so uh, we actually did copy a chunk of scratch file system. Oh, we had about a petabyte of total storage on uh, the, the vast uh, file system. So we copied about 400 terabytes 
uh, from uh, our scratch files. We just took the user-generated uh, check, uh, checkpoint files, just started copying them over. Um, interestingly enough, one of our guys that we didn't think we'd get any compression out of, we're, we're averaging about 1.8. <laughs> so um, that's not bad. That's better than we expected. Um, they said, oh, yeah, you should get around two. And we, we thought, ah, two may be too aggressive. Um, but, you know, uh, 400 terabytes of data on there compressed down to, you know, just over 220 terabytes of, of raw capacity. That's pretty good. Um, now, you, now you're getting more value out of your flash because you're also getting compression built into the, to the thing on the fly. So, uh, so I have some hope for these file systems. Um, cost is really kind of the big thing now. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we, we tried to, we thought about doing, deploying a flash file system later this year, um, but right now the cost per, ter per petabyte is just too high. Um, but once, whatever, PLC, whatever the ne next one after QLC is, and once the capacities of, of the NVMe drives get, you know, what, they're, they're already 32 terabytes now, or they're gonna be doubling at some point soon. Yeah, um, I, I just, I, I think flash is gonna be here, and so, uh, our, our impression is probably about 2025, 2026, we'll probably just have flash and tape. <laughs> uh, maybe some spinning cash for the tape, but, but not, not a huge amount, so. All right, okay, I could talk for hours about this, so y'all stop me, <laughs> um, so. Yeah, yeah, feel free, if you, and feel free to interrupt if you all have questions or anything. I, I like to talk on the fly, what you got? Yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, you said uh, we need to do benchmarking, right? So I have not had access to those systems as of yet uh, for, for benchmarking. Um, from, from our point of view, a lot of the benchmarking is A, to compare systems. But what, from a system administrator point of view, a lot of the times I'm doing benchmarking is regression testing. So I want to make sure that changes to the system aren't slowing down or impacting performance in some way, shape, or form. Uh, the HPC group typically builds the benchmarks for me um, and then give me job scripts and then I know what they should run. And you know, I spend about, uh, uh, me and Laura and Sean spend about an hour running benchmarks on Frontera after a system maintenance just to make sure, because you know, we run IO benchmarks, we run InfiniBand benchmarks, and then we run application benchmarks on the system. Um, and you know, we want to make sure we get good consistent performance. You know, and they're not seeing uh, deg degrading over time either. So, you know, I have benchmarks from 2019 when Frontera went first into production. I still have the data files for, so that I can make sure to go back and I can rerun those if I need to. Yeah, I mean, my question is really uh, looking uh, that you are looking for a new system. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, maybe maybe Frontera is good enough. Maybe Aurora is good enough. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what we need to do is be able to test at scale, and so we do hope to get access to Aurora at some point. I know it's still under construction, and and, uh, uh, and my understanding, Frontier is still not even accepted yet. Uh, so, uh, um, but uh, our, our HPC folks will hopefully get access to those systems to try to do the evaluations. Uh, so, but yeah, Thank you. benchmarking is is yeah fun. So, um, all right, so uh, Lone Star Six, we've done over a year of production on this system. Uh, we actually expanded the GPU subsystem on this. Uh, we retired our other IBM Longhorn system, uh, took it out of production, so we needed a replacement GPU, so we used the money that we were using to operate that system to uh, buy and expand uh, the GPU base on, on Lone Star Six. Um, uh, I mentioned this last uh, uh, inter energy conference, but uh, uh, we've also added a set of virtual compute nodes. And what we've done here is we basically put KVM, a little hypervisor layer on, on the node. Uh, we put uh, seven hard drives in the node. Um, and wh what we've done here is basically we've carved one of the 128 core nodes into uh, seven 16 core instances. Um, and what this allows us to do is those users who can't use all 128 cores on the node or don't need all the memory on the node and just have a small problem that they want to run, post-processing, some serial, you know, uh, pre-processing or someone, uh, we can give them the 16 core incident, instant, instances and then they can run on them at a much lower charge rate so they're not charged for the whole node. Um, yeah. Yes, so you, they still have access to the InfiniBand card. Um, uh, you know, uh, they, they can still mount the file systems natively. Um, 
A couple of things, the reason we opted for VMs rather than trying to carve out C groups and, and, and share the node is um, then we can ensure that they have their own local temp. A lot of these guys that are running on our nodes like to use the local temp space. We have about 300 gigabytes of SSD just sitting there for them to be able to use. Uh, and B, we can pin them and ensure that they're running on certain cores on the system and not have as much impact to the other people on the system. Unfortunately, they're, shared, they're still sharing CPUs. They're still sharing the InfiniBand card. Some resources are still shared on the node, so you're gonna see some performance impact if the node is heavily loaded. But, um, but you know, the challenge for us is we still have a lot of users that don't need a whole lot of CPUs, and they can't use 128 cores on a node. It's like, just, just carve out a little bit. Um, these have gotten pretty popular now, so um, we're thinking about adding some more drives to some other nodes just so that we can do this. Um, but you know, from the Slurm point of view, each virtual compute is basically a Slurm uh, a compute node um, in, in that regard. So, uh, and, and again, it's, it's, it's more of that we just had a bunch of users said, hey, I don't like wasting all my time on 128 cores and I can't actually use them all. And we're like, well, package your jobs together. And it's like, ah, that's work from us. Can you make it easy for us? <laughs> Which, from a system editor point of view, that's, that's actually kind of what our role is, is to make life easier for users. And so this was one way we made our life, uh, made their user lives easier, more administrative overhead from our point of view, though. So. Um, uh, the other big thing is we got eight brand new H100s. Uh, and if you haven't benchmarked on these H100 jets, uh, they are quite impressive. Uh, the downside is they didn't really get a whole lot more memory bandwidth on them. I think it's about a 30% improvement in memory bandwidth compared to the A100s. But the amount of cores and flops they provide is almost double uh, what the uh, A100s are. Um, we actually, one of the challenges we have now is these, these GPUs are PCI Gen 5. Our, old, our servers are Gen 4, uh, and, uh, uh, and also our servers weren't designed to deliver the power that is needed for these cards. Um, I, the current servers we got them in will only run up to about 310 watts per card, and the cards are 350 watts each. So uh, we just purchased some brand new Genoa, a PCI Gen 5 that it has more power uh, in the node so that we can install these H100s into them and hopefully get full power uh, out of the H100 nodes. So. Um, how am I doing on time, Keith? I'm running a little, a little late. So. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, so here's the, what a Lone Star 6 compute node actually looks like. So this is the, one of the 1U nodes uh, that we have. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you've got the two sockets, fully populated 256 gig uh, of DIMM. Um, uh, you know, the processors themselves are very performant. Um, if you can use all 128 cores on the node, uh, they can actually outperform an Ice Lake node, which came out at about the same time frame. Uh, the thing with the Ice Lake nodes is if you've got more serialized processes and you maybe can't scale very well to all 128 cores, well, you may want to run all the Ice Lake nodes. They, they do burst up frequency-wise a little bit better. So, um, but uh, um, we do have a, a bunch of 1U nodes and we also have a bunch of immersion nodes too. And this is one of the things that uh, I was going, uh, talking about before. Um, you know, we have the air-cooled racks. Uh, what we did here is we are limited by about 25 kilowatts of rack. So if you notice, we didn't actually fully populate uh, the racks. We put the GPU nodes kind of at the bottom of the rack where there's plenty of cooling, <laughs> and the regular CPU nodes at the top of the rack. Uh, and, and with this configuration, we were able to put uh, a switch in each of the racks. And then for the bulk of the compute nodes, we actually did immersion. So we used the GRC uh, oil immersion tanks, uh, the ice racks. Uh, they're capable of 80 kilowatts of rack. Um, again, here, cabling and, and fully populating the rack is, is a little bit challenging. Uh, you can see here, basically, everything, all the nodes in the oil uh, without everything mounted. And then once you get all the PDUs mounted on the back wall there, uh, all the InfiniBand, uh, uh, which is all the black copper cabling, uh, with the InfiniBand switches mounted. Um, is there a laser pointer here? <laughs> yeah, the InfiniBand switches get mounted, basically, in the little spot that's here. You can see there's some rack mount spots. Uh, for the, where the switches go. Uh, all the PDUs are mounted back here on the back. We took out this cable management arm. It got in the way. Um, <laughs> so you can see here all of our PDUs. We have five of these uh, uh, three-phase PDUs, 28 volt PDUs per rack. You can see the InfiniBand switches here. We had to mount them vertically. Um, we had to mount them upside down, and that's because they use heat pipes inside the InfiniBand switches, and heat pipes don't work if they're mounted the wrong direction. Nowhere in the manual did it say you couldn't mount the switches vertically. <laughs> we checked. We even asked them. 
Um, they're like, well, there's nothing in the manual that says you can't mount them vertically. Um, but apparently they didn't think about that. You need to mount them one direction vertically. Uh, this is one of those things we stumbled into after we actually had everything mounted. And it wasn't until we started plugging in the cables that the switches started to overheat. Um, and so we got about, we, we started installing all the f uh, uplink cables and it wasn't installed, we had about half the uplink cables running that uh, we noticed the thermal uh, amber lights started kicking on on the switches. So a mental note, future, future reference. <laughs> so um, the nice thing about these racks is you can put these pretty wraps on it. <laughs> um, since there's no blinky lights or anything on the system, we have to make it look nice some, some other way. Uh, so, so we just put a little wrap on the system to make it look, uh, look nice. Uh, I mentioned BGFS. Um, this was our very first BGFS deployment. Uh, it's, uh, it's worked pretty well. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have all the tools like we had for Lustre, uh, so we have had to write some other uh, utilities to be able to track you know, which clients are causing the most activity to the file system and so forth. Uh, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, how much bandwidth is being consumed and everything. We just don't have that ability to monitor that like we do with our tools in Lustre. Um, but again, we're working on hopefully implementing some of that and working with the uh, uh, Think Park team to uh, improve some of that. All right, I'm going to skip some of the slides here. Um, I did want to mention, uh, so I, I, I was talking about regression testing and, and uh, benchmarking and everything. So uh, one thing we try to do on our systems is offer a variety of compilers and MPI libraries. And part of this is because not everything works best for every application. And we realize that, hey, we need to have some variety so that A, people can do some comparisons, and B, if one is outperforming the other, we have some ability to uh, transition from one to the other. So um, interestingly enough, one of the advantages for having multiple MPIs now is they are ABI compatible. Uh, the nice thing about our, from our user point of view is they can compile their code once, and they literally can just do a module swap from Intel to MPI to Invapitch and not have to recompile their code and just run uh, or back and forth. And in fact, that was important recently because on our 128 core nodes, we stumbled into an application that if you use more than 96 cores on a node, all of a sudden you got this weird performance variability. And it's like, well, what's going on with this? And so we started looking at it and it's like, well, you go look at the node and you're, you're running top on the node and you know, the load shows 128, you know, there's 128 tasks. Um, but you start looking at the individual tasks and you see that, man, they're not really running at 100% CPU. They're flipping around, they're getting into the D state and everything. And uh, one thing we could do very quickly is like, well, this, this is weird. It looks like it might be an MPI problem like with process pinning and, and so forth. So we quickly were able to switch from the Intel MPI over to Vapage and boom, no performance issues. It's like, oh, okay, we're on 128 cores. Okay, so we know now it's an Intel MPI issue. And we were able to track back and figure out that it was just a tuning uh, option for uh, the Intel MPI. Um, but again, this is one of the nice things about having multiple compilers and multiple MPIs is you can do a kind of comparison and figure out, and, and, you know, if one isn't performing like you think it should, you can try the other one and see if you're getting better performance. Uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, and again, mileage may vary nowadays. It's really, really getting complicated uh, to, to be able to figure out what is the best general purpose nowadays? So we still support the Intel compiler on this one. It's usually still the be most performant. Uh, we do have the AMD compilers as well available that users can use. It's just not fully supported. And when I say fully supported, that means we don't build all the libraries and all the applications and everything else uh, that are built on top of the MPI uh, stacks. So, um, all right, um, let me jump forward a little bit here, skip. Uh, that's just what we've got installed. Um, all right. Um, so uh, again, uh, I think I've mentioned some of these things before, uh, but uh, again, you know, one thing we're seeing with the AMD processors, you know, per core performance is not as good as some of the Xeon cores. But if you can use all 128 cores on the node, it will outperform, uh, you know, 80 cores on an, on an isolate node. Uh, we do have additional expansion, so we designed this system. So our core switches, we have 16 core switches. Right now, they're only about two-thirds populated. So we can expand the system. We just need power and space <laughs> uh, from, from uh, hopefully systems that will be de decommissioned hardware soon. Um, uh, something that's been a hot topic and something we haven't really figured out is composability. All right, so 
Uh, we did try on Frontera, on, on Lone Star 6, we actually did purchase some Giga I.O. Uh, you know, we, we deployed it out and everything, tried to get it working. <sighs> I, we're still scratching our heads and trying to understand the value proposition for composability. Um, it's a very expensive PCI fabric you have to build for composability right now. And it's like, well, now I have to have two fabrics. I have to have this InfiniBand fabric and this other fabric to get these composability. Um, and from our point of view, the, the GPUs are almost always fully utilized anyway. It's like, well, I don't have spare things to move around. I, I can't really do this. So uh, from our point of view, composability, I mean, it, it sure sounds nice and sounds great, but, you know, it's just, it, it's, from an administrative point of view and from a management point of view, the, trying to manage it that way, it's, it's, I, I just don't see the feasibility as of yet. Um, now, that being said, moving forward with CXL and some of these other things that are coming, having more composability may be, may be uh, 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 available. But right now, from our point of view, and we've tested, in fact, we've got some liquid stuff. We've got Giga IO. Um, and, and you know, some of it is you have to have the latest kernel to be able to support some of the stuff. And it's like, well, I'm not ready to upgrade to the latest kernel yet. Uh, our users aren't ready for that. We haven't tested it. We aren't, we just aren't, aren't there yet. Um, so, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, I'd be curious. I mean, has anybody, has anybody got any other experience with composability or tested it? I'd like some feedback too, because again, I've, I've done it from my point of view. And, I'm, we're just not quite sure the value proposition. Because we see the cost, like they give us quotes for it, and it's like, oh my god, I gotta pay that much extra just for composability? Why don't I just buy more GPUs? <laughs> so, no, no feedback? Okay. <laughs> you didn't read the entire brochure. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't read the entire brochure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned, we are considering adding more virtual machines. Uh, we need more hard drives to be able to support this. Uh, it is something you might consider for your environment if you do have users that can't utilize full nodes uh, on your systems. And as you get more complex and bigger nodes, um, you know, there is one thing we are thinking about doing, and it's supposed to be fully supported in the A100s, is you can carve uh, the GPUs into instances as well. Uh, they're supposed to have MIG or something in there too, where you can basically carve out seven instances in the GPUs. And so there is some debate on our side about potentially making small GPU subsystems, mainly for classes. So uh, from that point of view, one of the challenges we have is, uh, you know, one of the, there's a big training class going on. It's got 100 students in it. Well, I've only got <laughs> 80 GPU nodes, and I can't dedicate all of them to the class. You know, if I could carve up one GPU node into seven, uh, where I could support, you know, more on the class, that might be an, a use case for, for carving up the GPU as well. So, um, and as I mentioned, uh, this is something I alluded to before, uh, be careful with older MPI versions, like Intel MPI versions, they may not, may not run well on uh, 128 cores uh, on the system, so. Um, all right, well, I'm pretty sure I'm past my time, but uh, let me just jump forward. Uh, so Stampede 2, pretty much the, the, the same thing on Stampede 2. Uh, you know, we have extended the operations until September of this year. Um, we did add the new Ice Lake hardware to it, replace some of the older KNL. We're only committed to keep the Knights Landings running until the summer. So after uh, in July 1st, I'm pretty sure we'll start decommissioning more of the KNL hardware. We have already started cannibalizing the, the Knights Landing hardware. It's not under warranty anymore, and so we've started. I think we're down at least three chassis now. So we've dropped 12 nodes. We're taking DIMMs, processors, and other things to keep our other hardware mm -hmm. running. Uh, we did give, get this guy up to CentOS 7.9 this last year. Uh, upgraded the OPA and Lustre Client as well. Uh, almost to 11 million jobs on the system. It's been a, a, a really big workhorse uh, in terms of the cycles. Uh, in fact, we went and looked at the entire NSF community. All the other systems combined haven't delivered as much per, uh, allocation as, as Stampede 2 alone. So uh, it's going to be a kind of a challenge for users when it goes offline later this year, uh, mainly because there are no other resources available for them to really run on. So uh, we're hoping NSF will get some funding available soon uh, and get some new, new systems. Um, I will mention, you know, this system has been in live for five years. I think we took two maintenances last year. We're literally just letting it run, keep it, keep it, keep it care and feeding, make sure that the, the system is happy. Um, but uh, uh, right now, we don't envision very many updates on the system. So, um, 
one other latest uh, thing I was going to ask or talk about is uh, um, OSs. Um, so uh, Lone Star 6 was our very first Rocky system, and I think we have a discussion later today on some of the OSs and everything too. Um, you know, Rocky has worked pretty well with us. Uh, we've we've uh, met with uh, Greg Kurtzer and the team at CIQ, I guess is the company that, that uh, is supporting it. Um, they, they have big plans for Rocky. We have hoped that they will continue to maintain Rocky and everything. Uh, we have had some challenges with, with Rocky 8, but it's not has nothing to do with Rocky itself. It's more RHEL. Uh, we really hate how they did their package management and their YUM environments and everything. Um, so we're, we will not deploy another system with eight. Um, our next system will likely be a nine, in a RHEL 9.1 or Rocky 9.1 system. Um, uh, eight has just been, yeah, the, the, how they did YUM or DNF, whatever they want to rename it to. <laughs> you know the old system means they're always going to refer to it as YUM. <laughs> they're just going to continue. To, but, but they broke some of that stuff with the, how they do Perl modules and all this stuff, crazy stuff, and it's just made trying to deploy uh, and clustered environments a little bit more challenging. We, we, we understand that that has been pulled out in, in, of RHEL 9. Um, and so hopefully uh, moving forward we'll, we'll get to that. But we haven't tested anything on, on RHEL 9 yet. Uh, but th that's in, in, the, in our, uh, hopefully later this year we'll get some time to, to focus on some of that. So I'd be curious, who, is anybody else using anything other than uh, Rocky or Red Hat? Any Alma Linux? You got some Alma? How are you liking the Alma stuff? Pretty good. I've talked to them too. They seem pretty supportive too, and it seems like they're going to keep it maintained and everything too. So, um, anybody doing Oracle? <laughs> you got Oracle Linux? Okay. Um, mainly for the infrastructure. Mainly for infrastructure. Okay. Um, they keep reaching out to me, and I keep. <laughs> just, <laughs> like, yeah. um, I, I, I'm concerned about them maintaining that that release line, but uh, I assume for their databases, they want to have some kind of OS that they know is certified and everything. So. Any, any other variants out there? Anybody else building clusters with Ubuntu? <laughs> SUSE, yeah, I, I mean, I know the Cray HP yeah. with SUSE. Um, probably not so much. Okay, so. Rocky, they will be supporting Rocky? Okay, I, I, I hadn't uh, talked to them about that. I, they said that they were getting more agnostic in terms of file, our OSs and being able to deploy more custom uh, OSs in their environments, so. Right, okay. Um, um, one other topic I'm just going to hit on and didn't really, uh, I meant to cover it in my uh, evaluations thing is interconnects. Um, this is kind of another big thing that we, we're concerned about uh, in the landscape. Um, and, uh, you know, Mellanox has still been working with us pretty well uh, as part of NVIDIA. Uh, it's definitely supporting and, and uh, continuing their the roadmap and development. Uh, uh, but, you know, we are keeping our eyes open on Cornellis. Uh, you know, they're, they're working hard. We've been running OPA on Stampy 2. It's worked pretty well. And, it, it, you know, there's some advantages of the OPA over InfiniBand. Um, but uh, uh, the other one I didn't mention is we are evaluating Rockport networks. So we have deployed Rockport networks at about 380 80 nodes or so um, and have been testing it. It's, it's definitely got some interesting uh, aspects to it, you know, not having to have switches that are powered. It's kind of, kind of a unique thing. Um, uh, but, you know, of course, we, we wanna, we're concerned about viability because they are a small company, venture funded, and, uh, you know, how, how long are they going to be able to, to, to uh, survive without uh, 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 big customers out there? So we're, we're keeping our eyes on that. Um, uh, and, of course, Slingshot with the Cray HPE stuff, we're, we're watching that, too. So hopefully get some testing on that. But um, is anybody moving to just Ethernet now? So just Ethernet, no, high, no InfiniBand, no low latency? With, with Rocky, yeah. How, how do you find configuring Rocky? Is it pretty easy? Okay. One, two, yeah, exactly. So this is the, the thing I hear about a lot on Rocky. I, again, I haven't tested it uh, myself, but it's a little bit challenging to get the initial config, but once you do have it set up, it, it works. Um, one thing I was kind of curious about, have you done any uh, large-scale latency measurements? Okay. Okay, so, so pretty good latencies, not, not seeing uh, really high latencies. You know, the NICs are getting better. Um, the switches are getting better. Melanox yeah, well, yeah, 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 Melanox NICs. Um, well, but even the Broadcom NICs are getting better. You know, they're, they're trying to drive lower latency. Um, 
you know, uh, there's some advantages to the Ethernet that, you know, that InfiniBand doesn't necessarily, you don't have to have a subnet manager, it's completely distributed. You know, there's, there's certainly some advantages like that. Um, my, my concern would be is congestion or, or uh, you know, when you get really a lot of traffic going on in the network. Is, yeah. is it, how? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll be around. Uh, do you have one more question? Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> how do you set that, uh, what do you set the identity routing? I mean, how do you know it's working? How do you, yeah, or it's not working? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> the only way I know it is working is when the subnet manager says that it has actually done the routing correctly and I run the IB Diagnet on it to test all the adaptive routing things and it reports that they are correct. Um, of course, that was also what it was reporting when we would have our errors in the fabric and we'd get some deadlock. Um, so, uh, but what I can see, and uh, so what I don't know though is I can't tell when I'm running my application, is it using multiple paths? Which paths is it choosing? How is it choosing? Uh, I, I, we get no transparency into seeing any of that. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure the mechanisms that, yeah, it's, just, it's hard. Uh, I mean, even taking a snapshot of what's going on in your fabric right now just to see what kind of congestion is happening is, is very difficult just because trying to measure all the data simultaneously is, is next to impossible. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so I, yeah, uh, it's unclear. Uh, like I said, we can see some applications improve. Uh, you know, if you're doing all-to-all -all communications, we do see that the bandwidth improves with all-to-all. At, large, at larger message sizes. Uh, we also see that the barrier increases by double the time. So, you know, we see that there is some impact in terms of latency uh, with adaptive routing. So, um, but yeah, there's no other way to know it's actually working other than it reporting that it's working. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. They certainly would want you to use, yeah, and I gotta, I, they sent me an appliance, a UFM appliance, and I, I got like, I just got it like two weeks ago, and I haven't had a chance to put it out there yet. But I'm gonna see if, how well that works. So, all right. Any other quick questions or anything? I'll be around most of the day, so if you do have one, come grab me at lunch, chat. Uh, happy to share horror stories, war stories, <laughs> whatever it has, uh, building systems, uh, and happy to share uh, uh, any any thoughts I have on or opinions on on some of this. So. With that, all right, thank you.